it's just going to be a, a one by one grid. You know. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, this, <laughs> so, so if there's too many variables, predictability becomes difficult. Yeah. And in any type of software development, there are huge amounts of variables. Uh, and so, actually, we're going to get to that now. That's um, that's a lot of what's from us is working around the engagement and uh, the, the adjusting of the variables. So. So the heart and soul is probably the most basic. Actually, I'll, I'll phrase this as a question: What's what's the heart and soul of any project? What do you need for a project to be successful? One component without this component, you can't you can't develop any project, no matter what. Vision. Vision. Okay, so we can have a vision, but without this component, we can have all the vision in the world. It's not going to work for us. Money. Money. Sure, we can have tons of money. Uh, but if we lack this component, money is still not going to help us. Capability. Capability. What, what do you mean by that? Well, that's a that's an all encompassing we have for everything. Else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I don't go. I don't go with that. I ask clarifying questions. You see. Sorry, you were saying. Yeah. Again, you can have all the time in the world. If we lack this component, it's uh, we can know what we want to build. We can have the money to build it. We can have the rest of our lives in which to accomplish it, but if we lack this ability, we can't do it. <laughs> the, the people who actually build the stuff, you guys, uh, without the people who have the knowledge to, to actually build a product, the product, the rest of the stuff is useless to us. It doesn't matter how much money we have if we can't find developers who can actually develop the code. It doesn't matter how much stuff we can develop if we don't know how to test it or deploy it or all these things. We need the competence. And I, I almost gave it to you with capability, but that was a bit of a that was a bit of a cop out statement. So the heart and soul of Scrum, and really the heart and soul of any project, is the team. Uh, and these are people that are not ice cream cones. I recently got some feedback on that one. Uh, and for the guy recording the talk, I can give you this as a picture of slides, just a little more interactive to put on the whiteboard. I don't I don't really care if the PowerPoint. I feel it's the dance of engagement. Uh, so in Scrum, we work in what we call uh, cross-functional teams. So what a cross-functional team is, really easily put, is all the competence required to take things from the initial idea to the point of delivery. So as in a lot of more traditional organizations, we might have uh, different departments for each of these particular functions. In Scrum teams, we take the different functions that are required, no matter what they might be, if it's a UX person or if it's a designer or it's, uh, you know, even marketers can join Scrum teams depending on what we're trying to accomplish. We get all the competence to, I'll put it in a very buzzwordy way, take things from concept to cash. From the moment somebody has an idea to the moment we're done with it. And we form them up into one team. So outwardly, and that's, that's a large person, not a large ice cream. So outwardly to the rest of the organization, it looks a little bit like this. It looks like one really competent person that we can just we can just ask them to do stuff for us and, and they can get it done because they're they're good at what they do. This is a cross-functional team. Now at that point we come to the thing that Chris said. We need a vision. We need to know what we're gonna build, right? We need people who actually want the stuff we're gonna build. So who wants work done? Who needs stuff done? Okay, sorry, I should have pointed out at the beginning. I don't ask rhetorical questions, so when I ask questions, I'm going to ask them, and then I'm going to wait for you guys to respond. If you don't do that, I'm just going to stand here and it's going to get off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who needs stuff done? Who needs work done in organizations? Customers. Customers, yeah. Definitely needs yeah. stuff done. Are they the only ones who ever need work done? Oh, they could be internal or external customers. Oh, yeah, so internal customers, we could say other departments, I guess. Right. Yeah. Hmm. What else? What else? Just pretty much everybody, but uh, we can list. Everybody's too broad to say I need more specifics. Team members, bosses. Uh, yes. Stakeholders, banks, lenders, vendors, managers. All the horses there. <laughs> yeah, I can only draw so quickly. Uh, managers. Uh, you had team members. Team, 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 team. Yeah. yeah, this is actually that's that's a great statement. Um, 
this is a very often missed one that the team themselves are a stakeholder to the stuff that they develop. Um, this is very often overlooked in organizations. I give you a good example of why this is important. Um, automated tests. Your customer is never going to ask you to build automated tests in the software that you design and build. Uh, but it's of tremendous value to them for you to have automated tests and to be able to deliver things more quickly. In this case, you need the team to perform as a stakeholder to that part of the project to say this is important, this adds value to the project, this is a good thing for all the other stakeholders to motivate those things. We call these people over here stakeholders. So, in most organizations, uh, People like to have this idea that uh, that uh, you know we have all these formalized processes for how we get work done. And these people need something that you know there's a specific method or some kind of form they fill out. That's not really how it works in most organizations. Usually, what happens is uh, this person says, "Hey, this thing is important for me. I need it done." And they go and they speak to a person and they ask them to get it done. Who do they speak to usually? Well, usually the person that helped them last time. They would like to think they speak to the most competent person or the person who's best suited, but no, they speak to the person who's most likely to say yes to their request. So the problem with this is what happens is you have different people all coming to different people over here and all giving them different requests. What happens is you have everybody working on, on different things, all having their own priorities, and it's impossible for them to gel together as a team because you have everybody moving away in different directions. And one of the core pieces of Scrum is that these people work together as a team to deliver things from start to finish. So all these people have different priorities. How do you set priorities? Wait, first, who has more than one thing that's top priority at the moment? I dispel a myth now. That's impossible by the laws of the universe. You can only ever have one top priority. If you have one second in which to work, the thing you choose to do in that one second, that's your top priority. Everything else is a lesser priority. So when people say to you everything is top priority, what they're really saying is you prioritize. You figure out, I'm not going to determine how you set your priorities. You, you literally cannot do more than one thing at a time. It's impossible. You cannot think about more than one thing at a time. Your brain does not actually allow you to process information any faster than one thing at a time. You cannot make a decision more than one decision at a time. So there really is only ever one top priority. But if people hand you a list and you have multiple priorities, how do you how do you prioritize? The more top the more teams. Okay, you can add more people. That's rarely a successful. Uh, but I mean, you as an individual, how do you prioritize when you get conflicting work? Oh, on uh, myself. Yeah, you as an individual. So you've got. I uh, think you're sitting here, and this person came over here and talked to you. And asked no, you. it wouldn't be working like that. I will always have a, a prioritization general. Okay. You know, in an organization, and he owns the whole shack. So, how does that person prioritize? He works together with the priority committee in short to decide those things. All right, I can, I can uh, tell you guess how it normally works is that you prioritize what is easiest to do. That's a very common way to prioritize. Or what is more fun. That's a very common way in the IT industry to prioritize, yeah. Other ways? Stuff that gives the most money. Stuff that gives the most money, return on investment. Other ways? Stuff that you have to do before you can do other stuff. Oh, so. Dependencies, sure. Looking for one more specific one. Give so you a hint, it's this guy here. The little face of your Oh, oh his pet projects. Oh, yeah, my, my pet projects. <laughs> and that's why you need this general. Oh, oh. But is that, are you looking for like some hierarchy, an internal hierarchy? That you know, Hierarchies, whoever yells the loudest, yeah. also yeah. a very common way of prioritizing. The problem with this setup, with individuals going to individuals, is everybody has a different top priority, and everybody has used a different method to arrive at that top priority. So we don't have any common agreement. We can't work together as a team. So in Scrum, we have a system to help alleviate that. What we try to do is make our priorities transparent. We do that using a tool we call the product backlog. 
sorry, it takes a moment to actually draw the line. I've tried to find ways to make you keep up with my speaking, but it doesn't. <laughs> so uh, product backlog is really nothing more complex than a prioritized list of the work to be done, or an ordered list of the work to be done. In the ideal world, we'd like to see this list ordered by the return on investment. Does it always work this way? Definitely not. There are always other concerns in organizations. There's, you know, politics and, and these types of things come into play. Uh, some managers had projects that have driven to the top of the thing, you know, this type of stuff. But ideally, we want to see stuff prioritized by return on investment. So can we let all these people come in here and reorder stuff however they'd like? No. How would priorities be set down? By the way, we'll talk also with some priority Yeah, I mean, if they all came in and did that, how would the priorities end up being set? It would be set by the last person to actually yeah. touch the list, right? That's I had a, I had a CTO once once upon a time. I didn't know we didn't have a save button in our backlog, so he used to go in and he used to uh, try stuff out, like, oh, how would it look if I did this? And he would rearrange everything, and then he'd just close it, you know. He didn't realize he didn't have to save his work, so every time we go to a planning meeting, it would turn out that uh, everything was added. Like, what is this random thing at the top? Anyway, side story. Uh, product backlog. Yeah, so prioritization general is a, is a good way to put it. It's a little militant for my taste, but we can... Uh, I think what, one of the reasons why we've always had it is that I've always worked with distributed teams. Mm -hmm. And the only way to make the ones that are not at the head office feel that they are actually part of the process mm -hmm. is to have this general guy actually being able to fulfill these tasks. So no one can actually change that in any way. Yeah, so they speak to this person over here, and that person changes it. Yeah, we call that a product owner in Scrum. Product owner has the uh, sole responsibility of the back. The backlog is there. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm talking about the level above because we can have several product owners and then one big priority list. Yeah, and then, then we're going to talk about more scaling stuff. I'm going to talk about one more example, and if we need to get into scaling later, we do it. But it feels like with, with seven people, we probably shouldn't have much of an issue around scaling. Mm -hmm. uh, ROI, ROI, sorry, return on investment. A little weak, this one's there. So the amount of effort we put into something versus how much we get out of it, basically. Which sounds like a simple enough calculation, but it's really not. Um, so yeah, we call that a little product owner instruct. They're in charge of determining what it is. And, and the word product here might throw you off a little bit. This is, there's a lot of discussion over whether we should start calling this just simply the work backlog. Um, because it's a list of stuff to be done. There could be multiple products in here as well. But it creates transparency. Everybody can look at this list and they can see this is where my thing sits in the priority order. We can have these committee meetings, we can discuss with one another, and we can come to agreement or at least have the same picture at the end of the meeting as to where the various priorities are. Um, so the product owner, for lack of a better way to put it, essentially stands as a, as a proxy between here and here, at least in the beginning. We come to that a bit later if that changes. But uh, their job is to is to take all the input of all these stakeholders and balance it against one another. That's why we always draw them with a little sad face. Uh, people are a little bit hard on their product owners very often. Uh, I hear you know they don't set priorities the right way, they don't dedicate enough time to the job, they don't know what they're doing. And that might or might not be true, but it's very important to keep in mind that all the yelling that used to take place over here to set priorities hasn't actually disappeared. This just moved over here, so this is a really, really tough job now. So now we have the people who can do a job. We hopefully have people who want the job done. We have a list of what it is we're going to do. What, what do you think we do then? We start doing things. Yeah, at some point we're going to have to do something, right? And this is enough talking about what we're going to do, we're probably going to have to do something. So in Scrum, we work in, and I'm very sorry about the drawing. My partner, he's a very good dude, where you get like little personalities and stuff with all these people. If you get sick, man, for me, that's what I can do. <laughs> so in Scrum, 
we work in something that we call sprints. Are you guys familiar with sprints? Have you covered that topic yet? Not so much, but we can touch upon it. Uh, a sprint is nothing more complex than a time box. If you talk about time boxes, a time box is a set amount of time in which something takes place. Uh, so I was given an hour for this talk. Okay, we started late, so this talk is a bad example. But at the end of an hour, I have no more time. I end the talk. So in Scrum, a time box, a sprint is anywhere from one to four weeks in time. And it's nothing more complicated than a period of time in which things take place. There are specific events that take place in that. So we're going to do the work. Is there anything we need to do before we start doing the work? Research. Research. What does that mean? Finding out what we think we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Yeah. We need to plan. And we have a ceremony for this in Scrum called Sprint Planning. Sprint Planning is nothing more complicated. The last thing I said. Sprint planning. Uh, yeah. yeah, sprint planning. And then I said sprint planning is nothing more complicated than, and I didn't get any further than that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so if you're wondering what it was not more complicated than, I haven't gotten that for you. It's nothing more complicated than looking at the top of the backlog and saying this is what we think we can accomplish in the upcoming time box. Uh, from here on out, I'll just say two weeks. When I say two weeks, I mean a sprint. A sprint can be anywhere from one to four weeks, but it's just easier to be able to say something. So, so we, uh, we, in planning, we look at the top of the backlog and we say, what do we think we can accomplish in two weeks? We pull that stuff out, we talk a little bit more about it, maybe we do some estimation, maybe not. Really quick point for when you actually join organizations using Scrum, estimation is not necessarily a requirement in Scrum. It's a common practice, but not necessarily a requirement. So we look at this stuff, we pull it off, and then we figure out what it is we're going to do. Probably break it down into a little bit more specifics, you know, actual actions we're going to take. Uh, and that results in the output from sprint planning, which is called a sprint backlog. Maybe you guys have seen sprint backlogs before. They often take the form of stuff on a wall with post-it notes and little pieces of paper and these things. If anybody's seen those. They don't have to take that form, but that's one of the more common forms that they take. Basically, we take all the stuff we're going to do, we break it down, we write those things on post it notes, we take it to the same time. And why we would use post notes is a whole other discussion that I won't get into today, but we might have some time for that. So now we have a plan for the next two weeks. We know what, what it is we're going to try to accomplish, what our goal coming out is. Uh, we have set a sprint goal here. Sprint goal is uh, basically yeah, what it is we're trying to accomplish. Uh, build a working battleship product. Uh, and the, the, the great thing about a sprint goal, sprint goals we use, we define business value with sprint goals. And they are used to help with uh, prioritization in the sprint. If, uh, for instance, somebody should say, well, it'd be great if your battleship product could also play monopoly. You would say, yeah, sure, that sounds, that sounds great in the future, but right now the sprint goal is to build a working battleship product. So we're not going to. And it sounds ridiculous, but you'd be uh, very surprised how often people say, well, can't you just make it play Monopoly too? I mean, how hard is that? Uh, how hard is that? That's a classic. <laughs> how hard can it be? It's easy, right? Oh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, that's not hard. Yeah, it just rolls dice, right? I, mean, I can do it. How hard can it be to make a computer do it? Anyway, so we've left this spring plan. We have a goal. Are things going to grow according to plan? No. Definitely not. Uh, even inside a two week time frame, you'd be surprised how hard it is to make things go to plan. So, for that in Scrum, we have a ceremony. And this one I'm quite sure you guys are familiar with called the Daily Scrum, or often commonly referred to as the Daily Stand Up. Uh, daily Stand Up is quite straightforward. It is a ceremony where we meet and we say, what happened since yesterday, what do I plan to accomplish today, and is there anything standing in my way from accomplishing? If there are things standing in our way, we figure out how we deal with them, we change the print backlog accordingly, and we continue about our work. So the daily scrum is all about trying to, uh, trying to roll with the punches and adapt to the fact that things do not go according to the plan. Do we need 
need to get rid of things from the priority list, that we need to, I don't want to say bring in extra help because that very rarely solves any kind of a problem. But anyway. So we do this. We go round and round every day. We talk to each other. We make sure we're communicating. We make sure we're helping each other. We make sure we are progressing towards our sprint goal and burning it down through our sprint backlog. And as we get towards the end of the sprint, we do something we call a sprint review. And this is to address the part you talked about, about um, uh, lack of engagement. Spring, spring review, quite simply put, is where we show what we've done for the last two weeks. We take up the work that we've done, we put it in front of our stakeholders, at the very least we put it in front of our product owner. Uh, ideally, we put it in front of the stakeholders, we show it to them, and we ask them, what do you think? Show it, demo it, you know, if possible, get them, let them put their hands on it and gather feedback. And uh, sometimes they say, that's perfect, that's exactly what I wanted, thank you very much. They never say that, but it's perfect, actually. <laughs> Ideally, what they're going to say is something along the lines of, uh, well, you know, it's pretty close to what I wanted, uh, but it's a, a, you know, I wish that button was a happier shade of blue or something like that. That's the kind of feedback that we're going to take and do that with somewhere down further at the back level. Or maybe they say, no, I think you missed my point entirely. Uh, this is not at all what I had envisioned for the product. Uh, you need to make some changes here, and we take that and feed it back up towards the top of the back. This is the main method by which we mitigate uh, risk in Scrum. By building working software all the time, showing it to people, and gathering feedback on it. Because when we do these two-year-long projects where we go away and we build something, we make a lot of assumptions along the way. We get into a certain mode where we think we know what the correct answer is, but uh, you've probably heard the, the uh, phrase, no plan survives contact with the enemy, well, no product ever survives contact with the customer. That's, uh, that you can be absolutely sure of. What you thought they wanted and what they actually want are probably very, very far away from one another. This is how we mitigate this as well, by having active engagement, getting feedback all the time, all the time showing. And coming to the point where you can actually deliver things in these sprints uh, is, is technically a very challenging thing. And that's one of the reasons I got involved with this, because we're talking a lot here about the skills required to do that. And you guys are practicing things like continuous delivery, test driven development, actually building feature complete stuff. Uh, this is very technically challenging for a lot of teams who've been in the industry for a long time. If you're used to making product, products over a one year time span where nothing comes together until the last week, that then this is going to be hot for you. So we do a demo and we gather feedback on what it is we've done. Then we have one final ceremony left in the sprint, which is called the sprint retrospective. And I think I talked about this last time, was it right? Yeah, I did the whole talk room whining bit, yeah. Uh, we're free eating though, in oh, yeah. terms. I'm not sure we have time. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the retrospective, quite simply put, is where we look at what we did over the last two weeks, what went well, what didn't go well, and what we're going to do differently next time. All this other stuff, or at least a lot of this other stuff, deals with what it is we're trying to build. The retrospective is very focused on how we actually built it. So uh, if we, for instance, in the sprint review, got that answer, no, this is entirely wrong, you missed my point entirely, you didn't get it. The retrospective is where we're going to talk about how did we miss that? How do we not have the information we needed at that point in time to build the thing the customer wanted the first time? What changes can we make to make sure the next time when we go into planning we have a better idea of what it is we want to do? Or maybe you didn't deliver anything in this print review. Maybe you got there and you had to stand up and say, yeah, we don't have anything. <coughs> so let me tell you, this is not uncommon. Uh, then that's what we're going to talk about in the retrospective. Uh, how you know? How do we get it so at the end of two weeks we have something to show our customers? And get back? So the retrospective is entirely focused on how it is we build the product, and this is the sprint. So when I say it's the time box, these are the ceremonies that take place inside the time box, and at the end of the time box it starts over. We do the same thing over again. Hmm? Can you repeat the retrospective? Uh, what is it that you do? Oh, uh, you. Uh, you mean as a general concept or more specific? No, like that said, uh, the retrospective is maybe 
we, we look at what we've done over the last two weeks, what went well, what didn't go well, and what we're going to change to do better next time. No worries. And I can send a lot of subjects uh, surrounding this. Retrospectives are, are, I make them sound like they're simple, they're probably one of the most difficult things to get right. I mean, this is like 80% of my job is planning and executing these things so that they're actually successful. We actually get to the root cause of problems and we, we find good ways of addressing them. This is kind of my bread and butter here. I say virtually nothing in this meeting and I work with teams. Teams are the ones who are who are the most useful in this area. They know how to build the product. They should come up with the plan. This is where I make my money. This is where I derive my enjoyment. Uh, and what comes out at the end of a sprint, and this is where my bad drawing skills become really obvious, because I actually have to tell you what this is, and I've been trying for years to do it better, but I can't. Anybody know what that is? No idea. Okay. It's a present. Thank you, Chris. It's a present with a photo on it. Very rarely do people actually get what's that in present. Okay, never mind. Oh, sorry. It's the best I can do. I've been trying to do it better for ages. Uh, what comes out at the end of the sprint is what we call the increment. Or, as I like to call it, the potentially shippable increment. The increment is nothing more complex than the software we have built, added to all the other increments that we've done in the past. Sounds simple enough, but this is one of the essential concepts in Scrum. Here we have a fully functional piece of our product. Because if, if there's all these little odds and ends left to tie up, you know, oh, well, it's a deep can see plot, as, uh, as they so often say in Swedish. It's, pre it's pretty much done. It's in principle, it's done. It's just, I just have to, and, and, then, I have to, and then there's a little bit of an end. And you'd be surprised how much this little <laughs> anyway, <laughs> as long as that's the situation, you cannot reorder this stuff here as much as you like. Because when the day comes you want to release the product, all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of work that we didn't know about. That wasn't visible to everybody. We didn't know what it was. So the ability to, to actually ship this thing frequently and quickly is very important to the success of Scrum. So that we can, we can basically, in, in projects, you can uh, decide that you need a specific feature set and you're not going to release until that feature set is done. Or, as you pointed out, you can do a specific date. You can say on this day, the product's going up. This is the important thing in Scrum. We want to be able to do that. We want to say on any day, we want to be able to say, you know what, we're going to ship this thing. Even if there is all this stuff left in the backlog, we're going to go out with this. And having basically a what you yourself about with Assassin's Creed games, they just ship it out and the game sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, do, we want to be building this stuff to a high level of technical <laughs> excellence. Uh, I would say Ubisoft is not a great example of that. However, Assassin's Creed are good games. I mean, yeah, they're a little bit buggy, but. Assassin's Creed 4, I found all the work done. I did everything in the game with one feather. Yeah, I did up to 90% of the game on this, and then I just like, this game sucks so hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, guys. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, no, but the idea is to build these things to, to a super high quality of excellence. Um, in Scrum, what we try to do is, is rather than build a lot of things badly, build a few things really well. Uh, have a kick-ass half instead of a half-ass whole, as I've heard of words before. Um, and to ensure that we're all in agreement on what is in this increment, we have something we call definition of done. Definition of done is uh, it's a checklist, uh, if you will. Or if you want to see it another way, it's a contract between these people and this person. What we mean when we say something is done. Because done to a developer is not at all the same thing as done to a tester, which is definitely not the same thing as done to a marketing person or done to a salesperson. When we say the word done, it is probably one of the most loaded terms in the software industry. I've heard done described as everything from checked in, I haven't even tried to build it, to an enormous checklist of stuff. You'd be very surprised how many professional software development companies are like, yeah, yeah, it's 
I don't know, it's checked in. It's a lot of stuff between checked in and delivered. So done defines what level uh, of quality, what specific things we need to do in order to say that this thing is ready. And that will vary depending on the context you work in. If you're delivering a consumer product, done is generally pretty intense. You know, you need to actually have stuff out to the user uh, and with, you know, functioning tests and you've got the feedback on it and all those sort of things. This could include things like metrics to get feedback on how people actually use the application. Whereas if you deliver to an internal customer, for instance, maybe it's okay to have a few bucks in the thing. Maybe it doesn't need to be perfect. Maybe done in this instance means the fastest thing you can possibly get out so that you can get feedback on it and learn from it and see what you're doing wrong. So this, this varies a lot depending on your context, but it's a very important part. I'm almost <coughs> done with Scrum. Can anybody tell me the one bit that I'm missing? Can you just tell me what is? Uh, sorry, a potentially shippable increment. I can send you all this in text form. You, know, you don't actually have to type it. Because I have like material which basically has, has everything I just said. <laughs> well, without the flavor, of course, but it doesn't have the same presentation value. Uh, and I will send the material anyway because it's a little bit more elaborate in some places. So I'm basically done with Scrum. Uh, I am missing only one component. Does anybody know what it is? It's the most famous role in Scrum. Scrum Master. Scrum Master, thank you. Scrum Master, we always draw with a little headband. Indicate his knowledge, his or her knowledge wait, wait, of jujitsu. Headband. Oh, okay. okay. It's right. indicating his or her knowledge of jujitsu. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So that was a headband. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many of you have heard of Scrum Masters before? Mm -hmm. What is a Scrum Master? What do they do? Remove some headbands. Oh. That is definitely one of the things they do. It's also a proxy between the product owner and the, and the team. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we could call that Gordy. I'll come back to that in just a second. Anything else? All right, so let's start with removal of impediments. Um, uh, heat and depth don't have to be fancy. It's a terrible word uh, to to do cross language because it's not like the most commonly used word by any means. Uh, impediments are anything that stands in the way of accomplishing your job, and this is part of the scrum master's duty. Is uh, when when the team says uh, that they have things that are uh, that are standing in their way of accomplishing what they need to accomplish to meet their sprint goal. Scrum master's job is to eliminate them with extreme prejudice. Ideally, eliminating them in a way that doesn't come back. And in this sense, you need it needs to be a little bit of a prideless job. Uh, you need to be willing to do pretty much anything. I mean, I my basic rule as a scrum master is I do everything but get coffee. Uh, what this means varies drastically. It's not like my whole role is getting coffee, which I don't do to begin with. But uh, of course, uh, sometimes I buy cake for the team to perk the team up. Uh, but uh, that's just uh, that's just a silly example. I also uh, I work with these people to help them figure out how to feed stuff into this in a more effective way, so that we get we get actually good input coming into the system. I've done everything from replace hard drives to to take arguments with management, removing any impediments that stands in the way of getting of the team doing what they do. That these people have a specific set of skills that we want them to bring to bear on a specific. We do not want them dealing with a lot of stuff that doesn't require their skill set. This is a valuable skill set. I'm a scrum master, I have no valuable skills whatsoever. So it's just. Let at least one person got I was joking there. Everyone else is like, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sure you're completely useless. <laughs> they don't get that. Uh, that's impediment removal. <laughs> that's impediment removal in one direction. Uh, but it happens in multiple directions, but I'm going to come back to it where it fits a little bit better as we go forward. So guarding. Um, 
especially your terminology there I was not big on, stands as a proxy between the team and the product. Okay, so, yeah. so what, what, what I was referring to is actually, you know, because if the product owner talks directly to the group about prioritization or, you know, about the, the practical aspects of implementing a solution, then that is in itself an impediment. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in, in that context, I think that, you know, the, the product owner should potentially, if he's not a, if he's a, a non-technical person, mm -hmm. he should definitely not talk to the, to the team. Yeah, yeah, so you meant about, about actual implementation. Yeah. Yes. Because we don't want him not talking to him or her, not talking to the team. That is definitely not what we want. No, absolutely. Yeah, I'll be yeah. clear on what I said there, because there was a lot of knots in that sentence. We would like the product owner to talk directly to the team. But absolutely, we do not want the product owner specifying exactly how people are going to technically implement it. That's because of the other feature that our team has, which is that of self-organization. <coughs> in Scrum, the way that said for you, question? I never No, no, that's, that's, the, that's the correct spelling of it. I actually hesitated <laughs> pointing it out. I was like, oh, I've done that enough now. Okay, right. sorry, well, uh, <clears throat> um, Yeah, in Scrum, uh, well, the way we work, instead of specifying exactly what it is, how we want the team to actually implement things, what we do is we work with giving the team problems. We say, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, I want to have Battleship books. And my business makes money off of Battleship games. Uh, and then we ask the team to self-organize to determine for themselves the best way to go about building that. Because these people are the experts. That's what we hired them to do, was solve technical problems for us. We didn't hire them to simply sit down and write the things that uh, that uh, we tell them to write, keystroke for keystroke. That's, yeah, some companies do do that, but that's not the way to be successful with Scrum teams. We want to empower them to figure out how to solve the problems in the <coughs> It's a great example somebody always gives. Um, we have some people who need to get over here to this little town. They need to cross the river. They need to get across this river. Yeah, it's it's a it's a town with some people and a river. In case that's not obvious, how can you get across the river? To build a bridge. Yeah. How else? Swim. Swim? Hmm? Or, a, or a catapult. Catapult? You can build a catapult? Yeah. Any other ways? Zip line. Zip line? Other ways? Tunnel? You could tunnel? Yeah. Go around. You could go around. You could wait for winter to come and for the river to freeze. Lots of different ways in which you can get across the river. We as teams in Scrum, to get us across the river. We don't tell them to build us a bridge. Because they might not have come up with these incredibly inventive solutions like, like building a catapult. We may also need to put uh, constraints on them though. We may need to say no rope and limbs as a result of getting across the river. In which case, a catapult would not be an ideal solution. We may need to say we need to get across the river in the next two days. So building a bridge might not be the best solution. Maybe we need to swim. Uh, we may need to say we're going to need to get across the river frequently and often, in which case we're going to look at building a bridge. But we feed them the problem we want solved, not the way in which we want them to solve it. We give them the, the business value we're trying to achieve and the constraints in which we want them to achieve it. And this helps a lot with creativity. So if the, strong, uh, if, the, if the product owner is trying to tell the team specifically how to implement things, that is one area of Scrum Master with performance and coaching for sure. Uh, also, the Scrum Master guards when people are trying to go around this system because people always want to, you know, their thing is always the highest priority, which is not unfair. Um, that, I mean, that's your job is to think the things that are most important to you as highest priority, or at least it's often your job. Um, so it's the Scrum Master's duty in this, in this instance to step in and not let these people go around the system. The approach that's taken here is it varies a lot from I always like to talk I think it's one of the biggest problems that we have uh, in, in the uh, Scrum industry as it were. Most Scrum Masters take the approach saying, no, we're in a two-week sprint, we can't help you, you have to come back in two weeks, go away. That's how effective that is. 
very ineffective. Because these people over here generally have a lot more power. I mean, not those, because that's the same people. So. The first three uh, generally have a lot more power to push than this person over here has to push. Uh, and in those situations, when you get into a shoving war, guess who wins? They win. Team ends up doing this thing, the scrum master tried to push away anyway. That happens two or three more times, and then the team has no reason to talk to you about it anymore. You obviously can't help them, right? This stuff's going to come through anyway. Uh, that's, at that point, I, you become what I refer to as a dead scrum master, and the dead scrum master is a useless scrum master. Uh, so the approach you take here can, can be very important. I take a very different approach, which has been, as of late, renamed to the Canadian no, apparently. Uh, <laughs> a colleague of mine came up with this. I say, yes, that does sound extremely important. I'd love to help you with that. Let's go see the product owner and get that priority right away. You take that person and try to go around the system, you come see the product owner, you look at the backlog, you talk about the stuff that's in there, and you say, no, I'm sorry, this, I, I get that you think this is super important, but if you look at all this other stuff, this other stuff is more important. But by doing this approach, you bring them into the process. What if it were the other way, though? What if it was super important? I always, I always have a hard time knowing what number to name. I'm going to go with a million pounds. You know, I work with a lot of different companies. So is that NASDAQ wants to say a million pounds? And like, <laughs> <laughs> a million crowds. We spend that in overages every day. Like, yeah. uh, we say a million crowds is a lot of money to this group, right? Yeah. Good. So uh, what if an opportunity presented itself uh, that was worth a million crowds and you had to act on it today? Are you going to say as the scrum master, no, we're in a two week sprint, go away, we can't help you? The whole point is we want to be flexible. That's the whole point of adapting the framework. But it's important that we take that discussion with the product owner because it's not our job to prioritize. And when you do this pushing approach to guarding as a scrum master, a lot of the time you are prioritizing, and that's not within your authority to do. Um, but also, the scrum master guards in another direction. They guard Scrum from the team. Uh, the team very often wants to break Scrum. They want to go back to the way in which they've always worked. Right, so the sprint review is a great example. So as I mentioned, a lot of teams have difficulty getting to a point where they deliver something in the sprint review, right? Which means every two weeks, you make them stand in front of all the people in the company and say, we don't have anything to show you. Guess how fun that is? It's pretty embarrassing. It feels awkward. It feels bad. Or even if they do have stuff, they put it up there and they say everybody hates it and they, it doesn't work and it looks like crap and it doesn't do this. And it's very uncomfortable, right? Most teams want to remove this meeting. Very common thing I talk to teams. Can we not just get rid of this current review thing? They should trust that we're doing the right thing. But if we're not getting this feedback, we don't know that we're doing the right thing. And if we're going to this meeting and people are telling us what we build is crap, well, they're not just doing that because they're jerks, right? Well, hopefully not. They're doing it because the thing we're building is not satisfying them. That's the problem we need to try to address, not removing the sprint review so that the uncomfortable, uncomfortableness goes away. So in this instance, the Scrum Master guards Scrum from the team. They say, no, we, we can't remove this. It's revealing an important problem here that we need to try to address. And that brings us to the last responsibility of the Scrum Master, which is coaching. I could very easily take the approach of saying, no, you're not allowed to get rid of the sprint review. But that's not going to encourage involvement. It's not going to motivate these people. It's not going to help them want to achieve things at the sprint review. It's just going to make them angry that they're being forced to do something. And this is also a very common thing. People take the two-day course, they get the certificate, and then they do what the book tells them. So when people say, we want to remove the sprint review, the answer is no, because the book says that we have to. Not a good way to increase motivation in teams. When my teams tell me they want to remove the sprint review, I explain the purpose of the sprint review, I explain to them what I'm observing in the sprint review, I ask them what they're observing in the sprint review, we have a discussion about it, I help them to try to see the value of the sprint review, and I coach them. Same thing with the organization. If these people over here are going to the sprint review and using words like crap and sort it out and so forth, not very good for the team's motivation, probably not good to foster a working relationship between 
between these two groups. I work with these people over here to help them give feedback. Or, you know, if the product owner is having trouble prioritizing the backlog, or maybe the stuff that's coming out of the backlog is not of good quality. The team can't understand it, we can't get predictability. We do coaching in that area. So they coach the organization as well. Then I said I'd jump back to impediments. So impediment removal we also do in two directions. You see a lot of this is set up to sort of minimize contact between these people and these people. Early on, I would say that is actually one of the, the ideas. Long term, that's not what we want. As we coach the organization, as we make progress, we want uh, these people to be able to talk directly to these people. These people are the ones who know what they want. We don't want to have every communication go via this person. We want to be able to get direct and fast and good feedback. That doesn't mean that we'll take priorities from these people. This person is still prioritizing because they're the ones who know what they want. If we want to lose, lose bits of information in every single time this communication takes place. So long term, the Scrum Master removes impediments from the team to the organization. I'm almost done. I realize it's new. I just want to say why I draw the Scrum Master with the right arm headband and then I can end there. Um, we draw the Scrum Master with a little headband to make them feel better about the fact that they have no actual authority in any time whatsoever. <laughs> Scrum Master is what we call a servant leader. Scrum Master lives to make the team successful. They do not have authority over the team. They don't tell the team how to solve problems. They don't assign tasks to the team. They don't tell the team what to do. They help the team understand the context of Scrum. They support them in whatever types of support they need, but they're not in charge of the team. They're definitely not in charge of these people over here. So who are they in charge of? Absolutely no one. But we give them a headband and they feel a little bit better about it. Uh, the, I like to tell people the original name of the Scrum Master. Before Scrum was actually published in the original uh, digests of Scrum, when it was still a working model, it had a different name, which I think actually does a much better job of uh, saying what the role actually is. And I like to tell people about it. It used to be called The Scrum Slave. <laughs> Anybody want to guess why they renamed that one? Yeah, it's really bad marketing, right? People don't pay 20,000 crowns a head to go to a two-day certification course to get certified as a slave. People don't buy books on how to become a slave. People don't volunteer for the role of slave. It's just bad marketing in general. But I'd like to point it out, because I think it does a much better job of illustrating what their point is. They really are a master of nothing. They, but you could say they're a master of Scrum in the sense that they're supposed to be experts on the subject of Scrum, but they're not in charge of anyone. First thing I tell my teams, one second. First thing I tell my teams is, uh, I did it when I just joined, I have a blog post about it, I can send you guys, is uh, I'm here, I'm very experienced in this. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to speak for the first three weeks I'm here, not speak, but you know, I'm not going to offer any opinions for the first two or three weeks, I'm just going to listen and learn about how things work. After that, I'll probably have some ideas. I'd appreciate if you guys were willing to try my ideas. But at the end of the day, if you guys are in charge of what happens here, I will never force you to do anything you don't want to do. They have the ultimate authority. If the whole team wants to overrule me, I back down and let them do what they want to do. Because frankly, if you order people to do stuff and they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it very well anyway, so it doesn't really help. Hmm? I was just going to say that as, as to, to our experience here, I've done Scrum for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. After six years, all Scrum masters were gone. Yeah, that's a fantastic just place to be. Disappear. Yeah, that's a fantastic place to be. Most organizations don't get that far. Uh, but yeah, I would say definitely the role of the Scrum master is to make themselves redundant. I haven't been in a situation where I've become redundant yet, but it's always my goal. That's all. I, I don't know, but. In my head, it's a, a function of all the developers having a great domain knowledge of what we do mm -hmm. in the industry we're in, and also seniority. Mm -hmm. But as our 25 year olds became 30, 32, and 34, mm -hmm. and with a lot of weight under their belts, oh. they kind of became totally self organized, yeah. organized including not having. 
I'm not sure it's necessarily an age thing as much as an environment. If you have a good environment, people spend time in it, then they will, they will get to develop the behaviors that we want. I think we can definitely do this with people who are 25. If they have the domain knowledge, as you say, a very important thing. That's why we have the product owner in the beginning. They're the ones with the domain knowledge. Often they'll be lack that. Over time, we definitely want them to have that. Uh, and, and the ability to self organize. And I said I had never, I had never left the team, but that's basically why I left out of group. Well, that I wanted to come back to the airport, but, uh, but I felt like, you know, these guys have got everything they're going to get out of me. They're going to be, they're going to be awesome no matter what happens. And I want to add another thing also mm -hmm. that we work in exception with Tom was to make all stakeholders understand, including the board, which is typically tough in law. Understand that you can never, ever, you're never, ever allowed to ask when does this thing shift? Uh -huh. Okay. And that took like three years to get to my own. I can say I've never gotten there, but frankly, from a strong perspective, we want to be able to say at the end of two weeks, if you want. The team is fine to us put, set whatever criteria they would like to use. To, to when they ship stuff, but no one, I, I almost killed the guy from Prime Ministers when he came in and went straight into the, to the team that actually was responsible for a big, big change in the user interfaces. And I asked, okay guys, when do we get this? Yeah, in, in, in the Scrum world, we try, to, we try to change that conversation. We try to make that every two weeks you could ship. Do you want to ship? Yes or no? But I see what you're saying. If they have a specific thing they're trying to work towards, they want all of these changes that cannot be accomplished in two weeks, that, then it becomes a very different conversation. And there are some predictability models and stuff like that for trying to figure that out, but I definitely have lots of success with you know. And the other problem trust with us, we're doing our best. And, and the other problem with that is that you remove marketing of one of the best things that they can have to propel uh, because if you have this great app release style thing, that's the easiest way to get a word yeah. of in. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But but there's nothing that says you can't do that in Scrum. I mean, uh, I, uh, will you guys cover no, concepts no, no, like I'm feature not, not. toggles? Or will you cover concepts like feature toggles at all? No, not yet. No, uh, but so, I no I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not a part of it cannot be a part of Scrum. What I'm saying is though that if you choose to remove time mm -hmm. out of the equation, yeah. Then you will have end up with a problem in the world. Sure. sure. No, but what, what we can often do in Scrum is uh, what we do is we use something called feature toggles or an agile things in general. Basically, we release the stuff and we don't show it behind it. So we get the code out there, the code is being used, it's getting exercised, we know that it's working. Uh, but then we can stop all this stuff up and then when the day comes, we, we turn the toggle on and we can have the big, the big to do less work. Another thing that we often do. Is you know we can we can showcase a lot of the features that are that we are working on <coughs> in the current sprint backlog during this this iteration because we are deploying to a staging server for instance you know so if anybody from marketing or you know comes in and says when is it is done but it's kind of done you know we can we can see it on the staging server but we're not pushing it into production before we are well, actually what sure is the is the big the big Apple style of yes. where you invite all the reporters and these yeah. Things. yeah. But these, well, these are the thing of the past, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in the software industry. We don't, we usually don't. I mean, in, in like, for well, instance, is, for instance I, I, was, I was recently listening to a podcast with, with a guy from GitHub. They, they release new software to production two or three times a day. Yeah, so, Amazon does it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so one, yeah, you don't make a five a day. Exactly. You don't, you don't make a big thing out of this. I mean, the, 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 the big thing from, from like when Windows 95 was released, you know, with its huge bodies, or when Apple releases new new products, you know, and, and, and reveal that this, in software in the software as a service industry is kind of not a big thing anymore. You just, you just but, but I, I still don't agree with that. I mean, we, we are software as a service. And the, the difference between us, and we probably push new code like three times a day, and, but we're still in great need of having at least three or four times a year where we have a big bang. And, and then those otherwise, do journalists say that we not? Yeah, but that, that's more of a, that's, that's not a, 
I would say that's more of a business need. It's like a marketing thing. Oh, well, certainly. But, but, without, you, you but have, without customers, you would not have any scrum at all. Yeah. You can have your big bang on the calendar and they're invited, but they don't know what's going to be. Yeah, well, the exactly. problem in yeah. our industry, they are very knowledgeable. Right. In the business to business industry, the journalists covering that industry are typically extremely knowledgeable. But what I'm saying is, you can be working internally, and then what exactly gets revealed and left out the curtain can be sort of changing until. Yeah, but at the same time, you yeah. have the problem that if, if you just aggregate the, the enormous amounts of code that you don't publish to your users, so there's a trade off between that. Yeah. That right. is all trade offs, and that's what we're taking the other side of that. Right? Exactly. So, I would yeah. also say so that, that you know, all code that needs to, that is, is ready for production should go to production because no matter what what we've done to minimize the risk of, of bugs, like, you know, practicing TDD or, you know, double checking things in, in, within this group, you know, and avoid feature creep, so we actually just ship what, what is really necessary. Still, you know, when, the sh when, 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 when code is in production, you know, used in the large scale, you, you, you encounter bugs sometimes because it doesn't really matter how careful you were. Some bugs are just yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah. And that's, you know, people will kill me for saying that because we, we teach you to do everything in your power to avoid that. But sometimes, unfortunately, that still happens. And that could be a staging thing, you know, that even if you have a production staging server that is mimicking the production server to almost ever, in every aspect, but still, this could be a slight little different, uh, you know, update in the kernel. The software of the operating system that it runs on, and all of a sudden nothing works. I, I had a great example of a bug we found like this once. Uh, or uh, when I worked to build Cadillac, we had a bug where it took us months to track down where our uh, tray application would disappear. You couldn't see that it was running the tray anymore. We had no idea why. We never found any testing. We tried for ages. Uh, uh, actually, eventually, I found it by accident one day. Um, what happened was if you would reboot Windows, uh, and, and leave it sitting at the logon screen for a while, it would launch into the admin user instead of the user you actually logged on with. So the tray icon would be at the wrong user. Not important why. The point was the bug happened only in the situation where you turned on Windows and you went away for a little bit and then you came back. Which is something you're never going to find in a lab situation, right? Because you're trying to actually test the thing. So you're not going to sit around a window. But in a working environment, that's going to happen every single day, right? You're going to turn the machine on, you're going to go get your coffee, you're going to come back. It's going to happen every single day. So there's always these types of things. That customers <coughs> always use our products in ways we never anticipate that they're going to. So about this big unveiling of new features, I would say that like, the feature toggle is a good approach. Yeah, the feature because toggle is a great approach. you actually get to use the stuff, you know, roll it out to the customer. And then when you, when you feel confident, yeah, let's set up a press release or press meeting and you know, buy some fresh but, but in our industry, that doesn't work because the journalist knows. No, I know, I know, but that's the problem. That's so, so the way we tried to solve that was that we had 25 customers that had signed a contract that we will actually push the code to them uh -huh. as soon as it's done. Yeah, that they are not allowed to speak to anyone. Yeah, yeah. And release to production doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that it has to go to everybody. Right? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, and, and these sprint reviews, I mean, these can vary as well, right? They can start with one person, we do another iteration, then we have three people, we do another iteration, and so on and so forth. I mean, this is a very, very uh, lean startup focused way of doing these things. It's there, there's actually two smaller and smaller audience, or steadily increase audience size to get the feedback. We increasingly use the library for that in, in, in a race project where you can, where you, can, you know, you can turn off certain, certain features for certain groups of users so you have. 10,000 users that we have in this music application that I'm building, and we're rolling out a new feature, and we can just target 500 of them, giving certain criteria that they're actually the most active, or we trust them, or whatever. And so we roll that out there. We see that in production, we can do some metrics and measurements, and see that it's working. Okay, cool. Let's roll it out for everybody. Otherwise, what you end up with is what I've started nicknaming the Google Plus phenomenon, right? When you have all the world users in the world, and, and you debut something to them all on one day, and the thing doesn't work the way it should work, or the way people expect it to work, they never come back, 
right? What happened to Google Plus? It's still kind of hanging around. Yes. Right? They're definitely have been putting a lot of, they're killing it now apparently, but but they've been putting a lot of effort into forcing people into that. But I mean, you get to want to chat with people, right? I tried Google Plus, I could see gaps actually there, but it doesn't work the way I want it to work. If they had rolled it out to 10 people and then to 100 people and then to 1,000 people and then to 10,000 people, so on and so forth, they would have learned a lot more. They would have had an awesome product on day one and probably just destroyed Facebook with it. But no, we put it to everybody on day one. And they over engineered that. that yeah, it's, it's my opinion. Uh, there was a lot of potential there. Yeah. Just really yeah, of course, we have the, 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 the world's largest user base. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so right. that's it, because that's the problem as well, right? You burn the world's largest user base. But that's uh, Eric Rice actually gave a talk years before Google Plus came out at Google about this, and he said exactly that. If I were you, I would never roll out anything to my users without doing it 10 or 15 times in smaller groups first. Other questions? Sorry, before we take lunch. Well, this was an overview of Scrum. There are several things that we will be covering during this 12 weeks, you know, and diving in into the process of creating the backlog, perhaps. That, you know, we're gonna, I, I spoke to you a few days ago about the icebox, the, the, you know, and, and the process of how we can. The not now backlog. The not now backlog, precisely. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things to be said about the self organization, you know, because. This not always work actually. No. It's just we're dealing with people. Uh, we always, we, we know that you know the shit can hit the fan. Uh, just one comment about adding more people to the to the team. There's one scenario where I think it's it's uh, it's a viable solution, and that's when we cannot map the necessary competence. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's basically the only thing. Yeah, you know. Only no, no. I mean, of course, there's always got to be change. Team. I just mean you have one feature and you're like, we need to get this done faster, more. Yeah, that, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. But, but for instance, if you, if you, you know, nine nine women can't make it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So if you, but if you have a back, back end heavy application, why don't put another dev in the field? Because, you know, that most of the stuff that we're working on is pure back end, <laughs> for instance. And, you know, so. Yeah, you know, and that's the uh, cost of that. Exactly. Right? That's, is that, that, I think that was it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We also talked a little bit about Kanban, which is like a another agile. Uh, I don't want to use the term that, but it's another thing that can be used in the agile environments. And the reason why why we are talking about this also is, of course, because we want to give, give you the, the foundation to build upon, and also that the Rails development, the way the way Rails as a framework is is, is structured. It supports this uh, this uh, this workflow basically, and and if you think about it on a on an abstract level, the test driven development is like a it's like a mini sprint in your own head kind of way, you know. So yeah, yeah. it's the this feedback loop, right? Yeah, like test. exactly. Each test is is yeah. like okay, so you, you you do the bare minimum uh, code, you implement the bare minimum amount of code just in order, in order to pass the the test is the same thing. If you have a if you have a feature described here, you just develop that feature. You don't think about, yeah, well, you know, it could be cool if this logo could spin, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. But if it's not in the in the feature request, uh, then you just don't do it. Or or even I mean, even when feature requests are broad, I mean, you, you never want to be building anything more than absolutely absolute happens, happens, right? That's uh, if, if new stuff is needed, we can take that in the next sprint, but just build what you absolutely have to today. That's a great example, sorry, I know it's not time. Great example from Feather Group with this. Uh, we had, um, we were, when we were rebuilding the driver's license system, did I ever tell you this story? I, th I feel like I did. You did. I, I did, yeah. Up. No, sorry. In that part where the one but yeah. Yeah. yeah, never mind. Everybody heard that story. <laughs> I, I have this tendency to repeat myself. Let's see lunch, yeah? <laughs> in general, I repeat myself, so whenever that's happening, you feel free just to interrupt me. So, you can't pause.